What's up, guys? Rick here with your DFS preview for this week's AT&T Byron Nelson, the final event before next week's PGA Championship at Oak Hill. I've uh, said it a couple times, but just putting it out there, I will be in route to Rochester at the end of this week. So I'll be there uh, all next week. Boots on the ground. Hope to have a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of analysis. I'll talk to some guys. We'll walk the golf course, all that fun stuff. So a lot of great things coming in the next uh, couple of weeks. We've got this event here, which is got a very top heavy field on a golf course that we've only seen a couple of times and we'll dive into all of that with the data and see what little nuggets we can find so should be a blast i'm excited let's sprint let's go tpc craig ranch is the golf course and i must remind you out of the gate that we have only seen this golf course uh, for two years they moved it to tpc craig ranch for this event in 2021 so we played it that year and we played it in 2022 we have the same champion for both of those years. His name is K.H. Lee. He is someone that we're going to talk about quite a bit here in just one second. But what do we see when we get to TPC Craig Ranch? Well, th this is very likely to be a birdie fest. We have seen very good scoring conditions and very low scores in the first two years. It is a par 72 that's going to play about 7,400 yards. But I think that maybe on a golf course that lacks a lot of defining features, I think the one thing uh, that is going to determine who finds success this week are the larger than average greens. So the greens are about 6,700 uh, square feet on average. That skews larger on the PGA Tour. And the regression model that I run here on rickrungood.com, my website, giant database for golf betting and fantasy, um, this points out basically two really important metrics for this week. Now, the caveat being, of course, we have less data for TPC Craig Ranch than we do for most other golf courses on the PGA Tour. But to me, this passes the eye test and passes kind of the sniff test. So the two stats that stand out for this golf course are strokes gained approach. It ranks second, which means that there is only one other course on the PGA Tour schedule in which strokes gained approach is more correlated to success. Uh, that's massive, especially for a golf course, uh, a stat, Strokes gain approach that is always very valuable relative to its other uh, stat peers, but to get basically the highest of the highest ranked course for one of the most important stats is important. The other thing is strokes gain putting, which is in theory, its value is much less than most other stats, uh, and it's much less than strokes gain approach, but it's more valuable here relative to other golf courses. So there's only six other golf courses on the PGA Tour in which strokes gain putting is more correlated to success. Approach and putting. Approach and putting. That makes sense to me, because when you see these green pot complexes, you see how large they are, and you have to think about what's going to happen. You're going to have a lot of guys who, uh, if they can hit their second shots well, they're going to be able to position themselves on the correct tier of the green, the correct spot of the green, the ability to give themselves a chance at a birdie putt, which is going to be super valuable this week. This is kind of like a, a, a track man type week, right? It's just a bunch of guys hitting two numbers, flying it there, not worrying about how it's going to release and how it's going to roll out. So that all passes the eye test. And then strokes game putting as well. Well, when you're on, it's two things. When you're on this big, these big surfaces, you have, uh, you've got to hit more lag putts, right? So who can, who can lag it well, and then who can roll in enough putts to make those birdies. There is a stat on the PGA tour, which we'll talk about in a second. I track it on my website. It's available in the custom model. It's called bonus putting. It essentially says, um, that's Oliver trying to get out of the room, by the way, I'll, I'll let him out in a second, but, uh, uh, I don't know if you can hear him huffing and puffing by the door. So the approach putt or the bonus putting is how many putts do you make within five feet and how many putts do you make outside of 20 or 25 feet? And essentially it says, do you make all your short putts and do you make any more? I'm going to let Ali out real quick. So when we get to a the custom model at the end of the show and we you know we start considering okay you know let's find bent grass putters we might also want to find some of those bonus putters uh, which I think is a fun little stat to include and I think this week it makes a lot of sense if you take those two years worth of data and you scroll down and you look at the guys who are playing uh, with those so basically the last you know 35 36 rounds whatever you want to use for who is playing to those metrics, you'll see no surprise that like Scotty Scheffler is going to be a great adjusted fit for basically every golf course in the world, but he's certainly going to be a great adjusted fit here. He's one of the best approach players in the world. The putter at times 
uh, can give him fits, but he puts to a zero quite a bit and no worries there. Jason Day, Eric Cole. We're going to talk a lot about Eric Cole. I, I think this is actually a, a really, really good setup for him. Someone who is not nearly as expensive as a lot of his peers. Terrell Hatton, Jordan Spieth, Sam Ryder, Dylan Wu. Those those types of golfers Michael Kim will talk about quite a bit. So uh, approach, putting. I think that's the combination birdie makers. Uh, and then we'll kind of go from there. It's a pretty top heavy field with, with some of the star power that I mentioned, but let's start assigning some salaries to these names and start looking through the pricing, the cheat sheet here at rickrungood.com. Uh, three golfers over $10,000, Scotty Scheffler, 11, nine, Jordan Spieth, 10, six, Terrell Hatton, 10, one, all well-deserved. Let's start with Scotty Scheffler. Uh, I think when you get a situation, I've talked about this countless times and I've talked about it, uh, recently within the last couple of weeks that when you get a golfer who is very short in the betting odds, like Scott, Scotty Scheffler is this week at plus 450, uh, that is generally not reflected as well in the DFS pricing as it should be. So when you get that big, one big heavy favorite, there's an argument to be made that that golfer could be uh, $12,000. That golfer could be $12,500. That golfer could be much more expensive. You usually don't see that reflected in the DFS pricing. So the point being that it's almost a little bit better to use him in uh, the fantasy game that you're playing as opposed to betting him outright. So what is Scotty Scheffler doing right now? Basically everything under the sun, right? The, the strokes gain T degree numbers have been nothing short of spectacular. Even, even uh, with some of the putting woes, losing strokes in four of the last five, he has uh, won the player's championship championship by gaining 0.11 over four rounds. He has been in contention uh, essentially every single event. He is in the midst of a 13 tournament stretch in which he has finished uh, inside the top 15. Think about that. 13 straight events, top 15 or better. He plays almost exclusively elevated events. That is insanity and now he's getting one of the weaker fields that we've had in his home state of texas i will say um you know kudos to jordan spieth kudos to scotty scheffler these guys who who when the new schedule came out elevated events and non-elevated events and they saw that you know the byron nelson the texas open like these were not elevated events they basically said yeah we're gonna play them anyway and whether it meant for scotty skipping the wells fargo to play this event and giving up his equity in that field fine uh but i thought it was cool that he kind of honored what he said he was going to do earlier in the year. So Scotty is far and away uh, the best player in this field. Uh, it's not even particularly close. We are going to learn what his projected ownership is going to be later in the week. Um, you know, as we get closer to lock and Wednesday during the, the live chat on Rick Rundgren YouTube channel, 3 p.m. Eastern time, we will have a much better idea of how popular Scotty is going to be. And that might be able to uh, make our decisions a little bit easier in one direction or another. He finished 15th here last year. He's got everything going for him. I don't think I have all that much more to add. Um, the the Jordan Spieth conversation, I think, is a little bit more interesting. You know, a very, very ugly miscut at the Wells Fargo Championship last week. A, a golf course at Quail Hollow that he hasn't played a ton in his career, and he lost across the board. That means he lost in every single strokes gains category. Uh, very concerning to see that he lost three and a half strokes on approach after being an elite approach player over the course of his previous eight starts or so. He lost from tee to green for the first time since Pebble Beach. Um, the putter was not good. Uh, and he had been on a pretty good stretch of golf with the flat stick before that. So this was an overall disaster. I don't know how willing you are to forgive quickly. I, I believe that I am. Let me show you a couple things that uh, point me in that direction. All right. So these are Jordan Spieth's uh, hole by hole strokes gained by, um, by category last week. And what you'll notice is that he lost big on a couple of shots. You know, you think back to round one on 18, where uh, he hit it in the water off his tee shot and he hit it in the water on his second shot. Well, that alone, that those two swings alone are minus 1.2 off the tee and minus 1.23 on approach. So we are already down 2.4 in the ball striking categories on two swings. So he's down 2.4 in the ball striking categories on two swings. Well, he lost um, two more in the ball striking categories over the course of every other shot he hit over 36 holes. Okay, so think about that. So half basically, uh, or more, more than half of his losses came on basically consecutive swings, which is not super concerning. It would be more concerning if he had a bunch of 
little losses, uh, which I which I don't believe to be the case. Uh, then you look, you know, around the green. So you look at his T to green numbers. You know, he lost one and a half strokes around the green on number six in round two alone. You know, he lost uh, on approach uh, in round two on number seven, one point six. Right. So th- these are water balls that he. So this is basically three bad full swings with the iron, a really bad chip. I don't know if he chipped into the water or what he did on six. I guess I could just look it up. Six on. Uh, six in round two, he, yeah, I mean, he flubbed one. Uh, yeah, it looks like he hit his second shot. Um, where did he hit his second shot? Second shot. Yeah. Then he like hit it over the green. It was, it was, it was pretty, he made a five from 43 feet. That's bizarre unless i'm missing something oh no oh no sorry this is the par three i was thinking this was the drivable par four no this is the par three so he hits his first shot over here looks like he chips it over the green chips it back over the green <laughs> like this is disaster zone anyway um if you if i add if i add this filter which is how many shots and how many holes he gained on you'll see he had a ton of little gains on approaching off the tape Right. And just a couple of big numbers that 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 set him off there. So I'm willing to kind of forgive that, especially based on what he has done, um, you know, in the ball striking categories before this. And then if you want kind of the additional, you know, I don't know if it's a narrative. I don't know if it is um, if it is quantifiable or not, but the way he plays in Houston. So Matt Gannon kind of tweeted this out this morning and I was like, yeah, let me just like I could just run with this real quick. So Houston Open, uh, the Texas Open, the Byron Nelson and the Charles Schwab. Uh, the, you know, the four events that get played uh, essentially annually in, in, in Texas, you can see. So his last handful of starts, T7 runner-up, T35 runner-up, T9 win. That's his last six. Missed the cut, two top tens before that. Uh, generally shows in Texas, I guess, is, is, is what the idea is here. And it helps that he gets one of the weaker uh, fields. So certainly no... No issue going back to Jordan Spieth. Hatton might be the interesting one, right? Um, you know, you get a situation where... If you just watch the reactions, Terrell Hatton played horrible last week, but that's that's not the actual case statistically. You know, he continues to be a, a very good ball striker. If you look at the 11 strokes he gained uh, from tee to green last week at the Wells Fargo Championship, that is the most he has gained since the Palmetto Championship at Congaree finished runner-up. That was in June of 2021. So we were coming up on two years, and it's not necessarily a flash in the pan, right? He has gained strokes from tee to green every event dating back to the BMW Championship last year. Also, all of his European Tour stats at the beginning of 2023 were good ball striking uh, weeks where he made deep runs. And look at his look at his results at these elevated events. Phoenix, he goes T6. Uh, API T4 runner up at the players now a T3 at the Wells Fargo championship. This is a, a significantly weaker field. I would not be super surprised to see Hatton uh, play well, to see him win, to see him do anything of that nature, right? This golf course is going to rely a bit on some of the longer shots. Hatton is, is generally pretty good from like 200 plus. Uh, not that I think that those statistics are incredibly great, but he's also uh, a very good lag uh, putter. He does not three putt very often there, there's a lot of things that when you look at the way that he sets up for this golf course eighth and strokes gain approach this season um there's a lot of really good things that are happening here so i i, I like hatton but the, the 10k range probably gets driven a lot by ownership the 9k range has a lot more question marks you know hideki matsuyama when he plays uh he plays well the problem is you, you kind of just don't know what version you're going to get. So um, it's my understanding that he skipped the Wells Fargo Championship and he was back in Japan getting uh, treatment for this neck injury that has continued to ail him for, what, the better part of a year or something like that. That's not particularly a good sign. Uh, I also think that for literally the guy who has the largest WD risk uh, on the PGA Tour, he's WD three times dating back to last summer, which is pretty significant. That's a lot for a golfer. Um, the the week before a major championship is always a scary week to play a guy like this because you would assume that he is not going to do anything to jeopardize his chances or his health at Oak Hill. So if it is a slow start, if he feels something on Thursday or Friday, I would not be surprised to see him protect it and go to next week. Uh, that is a lot of speculation. I understand that there's a big narrative there, but there are a lot of question marks and not necessarily a lot of answers for the state of Hideki's game. Now, the rest of this 9K range, you have KH Lee here. So I'll just pull this up. 
just so we can kind of get this out of the way. But this, uh, again, this golf course we've only seen twice. So TPC Craig Ranch. Uh, if you look at the raw strokes gained, uh, KH Lee is just head and shoulders above everybody else. He's gaining 3.68 per round over the course of eight rounds. It's two victories. It's basically 30 strokes gained at this golf course um, in two years. He's gained on in every single category in both years. No surprise there. He's got two victories. It's a full stroke better than anybody else. Jordan Spieth is, is next best. Spieth has a T9 and a runner-up finish. So KH Lee gets this, this huge nod, and he's kind of trending and peaking at the right time as he tries to go for you know, this, this elusive uh, third consecutive victory, something that has only been done, you know, a handful of times. And to imagine that KH Lee is going to add his name to that list is pretty remarkable, but uh, a T eight at the Wells Fargo championship, he's, been putting it much better. The ball striking numbers are uh, kind of hit or miss, but he's ga- capable of losing one, gaining four, losing one, gaining five. It's not necessarily a bad sign. I still think he is one of the more volatile golfers in this field, even at a golf course that uh, he has destroyed twice. I-, I-, I would not be surprised to see a large range of outcomes for him, but certainly possessing the upside that you're looking for this week, he will not come at an ownership discount. Now, I'm not particularly a big, um, a big Matt Kuchar guy. And I actually kind of want to lump in, actually I'll save Matt Kuchar. Cause I, I want to lump in Matt Kuchar at nine with, with uh Seamus power at 89 at $8,900. But let's uh, let's real quick. Look at uh, Jason day and Adam Scott. You know, there was a lot of support for Jason day last week, going back to, Quail Hollow, a place that he's played very well at, and it was a very disappointing uh, miscut. And he lost two strokes on approach, which is his worst loss on approach dating back to the Travelers Championship of 2022, which was in June. So we're coming up on a year off of that. He missed the cut on the number. He gained 0.8 strokes and missed the cut on the number. That is not a terrible stat profile by any stretch of the imagination, right? If you if you extrapolate this out, he was on pace to gain 3.2 strokes on approach. He lost the most he's lost in a year, excuse me, off the tee. He lost the most that he has in a year on approach. That is unlikely to happen again. He gained uh, two strokes putting. Again, you double that, you get him to four strokes putting, and it looks a lot similar to some of these top 10 finishes. So it is basically just a... Uh, a 52 week low in terms of strokes gain approach, willing to go right back to him. And then Adam Scott, you know, I I actually think I fired this up last week and said, look at Adam Scott's approach numbers. There's a couple ways to, there's a couple ways to look at this. You know, he has been struggling on approach, but still finding some pretty decent finishes. And it's like, well, that, that could be described as a good sign. Well, he then hit the ball beautifully at Quail Hollow and that's that's the moment that he needs, right? That's that's the thing that he fixes, gains, you know, eight strokes to his own baseline over the course of his last handful of starts on approach and now it's a T5. Is that sustainable? Uh, I don't particularly know the answer to that question. I, I think I'm probably more bullish on Jason Day coming off of a, a, a 52-week low in that category as opposed to Adam Scott who had a seven-stroke uh improvement on approach from the RBC heritage to the Wells Fargo championship. I I think that that Jason day might set up a little bit better as far as kind of bounce back abilities concerned. It feels like both of them could bounce back to their mean and it would be Jay day who would have the advantage there. Uh, Kuchar and Seamus power. I'm going to lump together here. Kuchar's 9,000 power is 8,900. I am not a big fan of Kuchar. I don't play him very often. And, and you're seeing in the stat profile why, right? He loses uh, 5.6 strokes in the ball striking categories around Quail Hollow, but he's still able to finish T23 because his short game goes out and is, is scorching hot. And he gains 11 strokes uh, between the two short game categories. Uh, kind of a similar story at RBC Heritage where he loses strokes on approach, gains a ton in the short game categories, finishes T20. Last time we saw him in Texas, the Texas Open finished, uh, actually last two times we saw him in Texas, he played pretty well, right? Which was just his third and fourth start ago. So Texas Open gained seven and a half strokes on approach and then match play at Austin Country Club. He gets out of his group and uh, gets to the Sweet 16 before getting eliminated. Now, if you look at what he has done at this golf course, you're going to see he is near the top of the list in strokes gained uh, at TPC Craig Ranch. So he's got a T17 and a T12 in which he also has gained across the board in in each of the four major categories in each of the last two years. So if there was ever a time to get Kuchar, I think this is probably the spot. Um, I don't want to say he's playing great, but he is putting up good results, going back to a golf course and a state that he's had a lot of success in. And I don't 
know how sexy or popular he is going to be. The other one that I lump into this is Sheamus Power. Sheamus has been in a slump, right? Sheamus had not been playing particularly well and then goes out and finishes T18 at the Wells Fargo Championship. Yes, he was a little reliant on the putter. He gained 3.6 strokes there. That's not that's not un characteristic that's not abnormal right he gained basically the same thing at the masters gained basically the same thing at riviera basically the same thing at phoenix right so that that is all fine drove it much better okay that looks a little bit more like what we saw at the end of 2022 and into the start of 2023 for Seamus power he hit uh hit it well on approach he gained a stroke on approach in an elevated event okay this is a decent stat profile and then again you go back and say well he's basically had the same exact history around TPC Craig Ranch as Matt Kuchar has, gaining 1.81 uh, strokes uh, uh, per round over eight rounds, a ninth place finish and a 17th place finish. I think that's exactly what, no, Kuchar's done a 17th and a 12th. So basically almost exactly the same, a little bit different. You know, uh, Power has not driven it well. He's lost a little bit off the tee in each of his last uh, two trips to this place, but putts it well, might have these, might have these greens figured out. I think they're two pretty interesting options at the you know, a, a, a pretty decent price that you can work in $9,000 for Kuchar and 8,900 for Seamus. As we enter the 8K range, let me pull up this uh, tool real quick. This, this trends tool that I, that I love and continue to love. And I made an improvement to last week. So basically what we have here is um, basically how hot and how cold each golfer is and then uh, how far or ahead or below they're playing in their baseline. And then also this new strokes gain trend column that says, okay, take their 100 round baseline, take what they're doing right now and assign a number to it and start comparing these golfers to one another. So that's what I'm doing right now. Um, Scotty Scheffler has the best strokes gain trend in the last 36 rounds. We can go a little bit more recent in a second, but Jason Day is next. Terrell Hatton, Minwoo Lee, Jordan Spieth, Michael Kim, Eric Cole. So the way to read this is essentially like this, right? So uh, I'll give you an example of a guy playing below his baseline and a guy playing above his baseline. So Tom Kim, who is in his last 36 rounds playing a third of a stroke per round below his own baseline, is a little bit worse than Adam Shank, who is playing two thirds of a stroke over his baseline in the last 36. So basically... Shank's baseline plus how he's playing recently is worth uh, 0.95 strokes per round. Tom Kim, who is obviously a much better player long term, who is playing below his baseline is worth 0.88 strokes per round. So that that's the way to look at this. So you can see this and say, you know, Matt Kuchar and uh, Dylan Wu are playing essentially the same golf right now. Dylan Wu is doing it by playing a stroke over his own baseline. Matt Kuchar is doing it by playing just a quarter of a stroke per round over his own baseline. So I really like the way that this sets up. And you're going to see, like, Minwoo Lee is here, right? Minwoo Lee, and the way that Minwoo is doing it, you know, gaining most of his improvement on approach is a good sign. He's in this $8,400 category. He's basically by far... Uh, the best strokes gain trend player in the last 36 in this uh, in this 8K range. If we look a little bit closer and go to the last 12 rounds, now this is going to create a lot of uh, more um, volatile results. So you get Matt Kuchar is now the best in strokes gain trend. So that looks at his 100 round baseline, looks at his last 12 rounds. How much is he playing over it and adds it together? So basically he's 1.2 strokes over his own baseline. And his own baseline was already like a stroke or 0.8 strokes uh, per round. So that's a very good number. Then you get this guy, uh, and I believe I'll pronounce this correctly, David Michaeluzzi. He's got to be, I think he's Australian. Um, I will show you his stat profile at, when we get down to the $6,600 range because it's it's a small sample size and it's rare. Like he played one live golf event, but I don't think he's on live golf so it's it's weird i'll show you him in a second but just kind of wanted to point out this this uh strokes gain trend tool and then if you do you know like i like using the last 36 rounds if you scroll down and you look at golfers that are ready to pop off this breakout candidates tool you know jeff ogilvy probably a smaller sample size but like guys like carson young terrell hatton harry hall uh, Martin Trainer, Jonas Blix, they're all kind of in the correct quadrant that you want to be in. Uh, guys in the second best quadrant, Dylan Wu, Trevor Werbelow, uh, Eric Cole, et cetera, et cetera. So pretty interesting stuff there. Worth noting that as of right now, as of me recording this right now, um, Aaron Wise is back in this field and he's teeing it up for the first time in a while. He 
withdrew uh, before the Masters and said he just needed a mental health break. He needed to get away from the game. You can see the results had not been going well for him. He missed the cut at the players. He missed the cut at the API. He missed the cut in Phoenix. He missed the cut at the American Express. He did not get out of his group in match play. He's not played particularly well. The stats are not there. This is the first time we're seeing him play since the match play. So going on, what is that, a month and a half? I have zero idea about anything else. I don't know if he will actually tee it up, but he's in the field as of as of right now. Uh, I do not know the status of his game. I do not know if he has been practicing. I don't know if he's been playing. I don't know if he's just been chilling and, and getting, getting right and feeling good. I, do, I have no idea. Um, but what I do want to do is at least look and see kind of where he falls in terms of like the last 100 rounds right like is it safe to assume that we can reset Aaron Wise back to his 100 round baseline I don't know that's up to you to decide if we can do that if we do he's got the 19th best strokes gain numbers in this field um basically the same as as Steven Yeager and SH Kim and Siwoo Kim and that even includes a lot of really poor events at the end that would have that would have tanked this number right so if i think it is an incredibly risky play just because there's a lot of unknowns here but longer term he's he's one of the better players in this field the only other thing i'll point out in this range of the eight thousand dollar range is you know there are not a lot of guys in this range that do the two things that i really want this week the ability to gain on approach and the ability to gain with the putter seamus power uh does but it's it's very little especially with the putter benny on uh comes close but does not has not been putting well enough, although he's, he's, he's been putting in an improvement. Uh, Tom Hoagie does check off both of these, but again, it's very small in the putting category. Christian Bezadenhout does both. Again, a little bit of a gainer on approach, a little bit of a gainer with the putter. There is not a real guy, you know, like a, um, I don't know who would be a good example, like a Sam Ryder, right, who usually does those two things very well. A, a Lonto Griffin, who historically has done those two two things very well. The 8K range, to me, is kind of void of golfers that have the two things that I'm really looking for outside of maybe Seamus Power, outside of maybe Tom Hoagie, and then Minwoo Lee, who we talked about, who's just playing kind of over his own head right now. Uh, let's pull up Minwoo because he probably hasn't been on your radar since he made that deep run at the players. Yeah, it was the players. So he missed the cut. The Masters missed the cut. The RBC Heritage has not played since then. Um, he's He's got to get the ball striking stuff figured out a little bit. He kind of lost it. But if he can do that, obviously, incredibly, incredibly talented golfer. So here's the 7K range. And I think, you know, almost instantly you can see why. I think I prefer the uh, the seven K range over the eight K range. There are a lot of guys who are gaining a ton of strokes on approach per round here in the last thirty six. There are also a lot of guys who can roll the rock uh, in that same range uh, or in that same time frame. So let's flip this around. Let's sort this by strokes gained approach. What do we see? Guys that we've played a lot of in the last handful of weeks. So Dylan Cool, Dylan Cool, Dylan Wu is cool. The best approach player. Uh, in this range over the last 35 rounds, Eric Cole right behind, 0. 0.59, 0. 0.58. Sam Stevens, Eric Van Royen, Michael Kim. Those are the five golfers who are gaining at least a half a stroke per round on approach. What else do you see? Well, three of those guys are gaining basically a half a stroke per round with the putter as well. Dylan Wu, Eric Cole, Michael Kim. So that's where I'm focusing a lot of my attention here in this range. It's, it's basically the middle of the 7K range on guys with elite uh, or, or I guess tangible skill sets for this golf course that have been playing really, really well. Let me pull up a couple of them. Dylan Wu, we've talked about a lot. Uh, let's do Eric Cole real quick. Eric Cole. And actually, while I'm pulling this up, let me show you something else while I have it. Uh, this is the amount of people who watch these videos who are subscribed. Uh, about half of you who are watching this are not subscribed. So there might be 10,000 people who watch this. 5,000 of you are not subscribed. Do me a favor. Subscribe, hit the notification. I think I've proven I do this week in and week out with some valuable, tangible information. Do me a favor, subscribe, and we'll rock and roll. It continues to help me do cool stuff uh, along the way. Here's Eric Cole. So what do you see here? Very good approach player. Has gained, I'm going to say he's gained strokes on approach in every event dating back to the Houston Open. That is not technically correct. He lost 02 in one measured round at the Farmers, and he lost 07 at the Valero Texas Open. But I'll give it to him, right? We'll round up. Very good approach player. And then his putting is generally positive, but he can get hot, and it's a little bit more volatile than some of the better putters that we see. But that's okay. 
you know, he gets a hot putter in Mexico, gains six strokes there, finishes T5. Gets a hot putter at the Honda Classic, gains eight, finishes runner-up. And you can see he's got some gains of one and two uh, in, in other weeks during that stretch. Dylan Wu, I'll just flash his profile really quick because, uh, again, we spend a lot of oxygen on Dylan Wu. I think he's one of the most undervalued golfers on the PGA Tour in terms of fantasy right now and a lot of other formats. It's just he's like a top 25 machine. He does it in a lot of good categories, and this is a good setup for him. The other one is Michael Kim. If you haven't been paying attention, Michael Kim's playing much better golf as of late. He's got a five or six uh, stretch. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sorry, I, I short I short changed him. Seven straight events of making the cut. Two top five finishes during that stretch. Another top 20 at the Zurich with his partner, and he finished T26 in Punta Cana. What does he do? Hits it well, right? He's gained in four straight measured events in five of his last six, and he's gained at least three strokes putting in each of his last four measured events. This is a good stat profile. Um just, you know, for, for what we're looking for this week in terms of a little bit of value, a little bit of approach, a little bit of putting. Probably the only other one that I'm uh, considering strongly here is Mark Hubbard. He's $7,300. So he made an ace last week, which is certainly going to inflate his, uh, you know, fantasy points and things of that nature. But it is not just last week. He's played a lot better since he had like foot surgery, right? Or toe surgery. I think he did that in the off season or in the, uh, the break from like December to January, but look at that. So he finishes T11 at RBC heritage. That's an elevated event. He finishes T18 in Mexico, T27 at the Wells Fargo championship. He's playing a lot better golf as of late ball striking is there. Putting is there. These are all good signs to see. And then his history here, which is, Pretty much some of the better history that you can get in this range. Again, we're only looking at the last two years. That's TPC Craig Ranch. It's a T34 and a T32. Fine. Uh, where he's gained nearly nine strokes on approach over the course of those eight rounds. Has putted it well both years. This is a general, generally a pretty good stat profile for a guy in a weak field event that you're going to find sitting at um, you know $7,300, offering a little bit of value. Has a couple of top 35s here. Is playing well coming in. That's about as good as you're going to get down in this range. The 6K range is here. The the Cootie brothers, so both of them are in the field. Uh, I believe Pearson and Parker are both in the field. Pearson is the one who's had better success. Is Parker in this field? He's definitely in this field, right? I saw him on the... Uh Parker, yeah. I, he's flat 6,000. I saw him on the, um, the media availability. So here's Pearson. I think before I reveal his golfer profile page, I love the kid's talent. I think everybody understands he is going to be a very good professional. He's probably going to have a pretty long career. He's got a decent pedigree, all that stuff. But man, this is a really tough stat profile to figure out. Um, you know, he comes out, he wins Panama in February after winning in Maine in June. So he basically gets two corn fairy star, two two corn two corn fairy wins in his in in a 10 start stretch. Now, in between that, there were a ton of miscuts, a WD like it was not good in between that. But that is not unusual for a corn fairy tour player. There a lot of them look a lot of stat profiles look like that. But his PGA Tour stat profile kind of looks similar, at least what he's done in 2023. So, plays well at API, gets everybody all hot and bothered, misses the cut at Valspar, then misses the cut at a Corn Ferry Tour event, makes the cut at the Texas Open, plays well at the Veritex, T15, plays well at the Suncoast Classic, plays well at the Hometown Lenders Championship two weeks ago, T8, T11 those weeks, plays the Wells Fargo, and kind of gets his butt handed to him, right? Loses nine strokes to the field, seven from T to green, um, just loses across the board this is a stat profile of a guy i don't know what to do with if you're looking for a flyer and hopefully he's like two percent owned or something like that i guess we'll see but i know he is kind of popular um this might be interesting but there's a lot a lot of risk here parker and don't confuse the two um has not had the amount of success yet. You see, I don't, I don't know what his status is. I don't, I don't think he has full status on the Corn Ferry because he's only played a handful of times. But he has missed uh, five of uh, four of his last five cuts. Four of his five cuts this year is he made the cut at the Veritex. He finished T fifty two. Don't confuse the two. Uh, Pearson is as of right now the tangibly better golfer, but comes with a ton of risk as well. I promise showing you the profile of David Michaeluzzi. I believe. Is how he uh, how he pronounces this. So this is a bizarre. I stumbled across this guy. It's a very bizarre profile. 
Um, so he's played. So here is just in 2023 of the of the of the tours that Rick Run Good measures. So that's six tours: PGA Tour, Corn Ferry Senior Tour, European Tour, uh, Asian Tour, Live Golf. I only have three starts for him. So he played the New Zealand Open in March and finished 17th. That's an Asian Tour event. That's pretty good. Then he played on Live in Adelaide in April and finished 17th. Okay, that's that's pretty good. Then he played the Korea Championship, which was just at the end of April, just a couple weeks ago, on the European Tour. So we've got three starts on three tours. He finished T21. So he's got three top 21 finishes in three starts across the globe. You go back to the end of, 20, of, of 2022, finished sixth at the Fortinet Australian PGA Championship. That was the event that Cam Smith won. He finished T10 at the ISPS Handa Australian Open. These are good results. I just don't know what he's doing in the meantime. Uh, I don't love the stats that I have on him, though I will say it is only one. I only, I only have like one measured event on him, uh, which was the Korea Championship. He gained a ton of strokes around the green, a ton of strokes with the putter, finished T21. I'm just throwing, I, I have no idea if you want to play this guy. I'm just trying to do my best to educate and and show you a couple of options. He is $6,600. Seems like when he plays, he plays pretty well, but I do not know how he's been spending his time outside of those weeks that that I uh, that I have in the database. All right, actually, I do know what he's been up to, and I wish I did not look this up because now I'm going to play the guy. Um, so he looks like he's been playing on PGA Tour of Australasia, which he won on that tour couple starts ago, finished T4 prior to that, then the T21 at the Korea Championship. He won TPS Sydney, finished runner-up at the Vic Open. So he's played a lot of competitive golf, and he has played very, very well. God, I'm going to play this guy, aren't I? This is pretty good. I mean, he's ranked 361st in the world. I bet you there are guys who are worse ranked in this field. There certainly are. I cannot believe I looked, and now I'm going to end up playing this guy. I will also give Carson Young uh, one more go around here. He missed the cut on the number last week. Again, you gain 0.8 strokes to the field and you missed the cut on the number. I am not going to worry too much about that. He didn't drive it particularly well. He usually drives it better. He gained on approach exactly the way we would expect. He lost around the green exactly the way we would expect. He putted exactly as we as we would expect. So, no problem. Go right back to him. Carson Young. Okay, let's run a model. Um, and this is the Rick Run Good uh, custom model. You can put in, you know, any number of. I think there's 150 different options now that you can put your put in. It's absolutely awesome. Before I forget, let me just put in the stuff that I said I was going to put in. So, so let's go um, 10 on stroke gain putting on bent grass. Let's do 10 on bonus putting. Okay, and actually, I've got to do. So I also probably have to do, like. Five. I mean, it's going to be a lot. We're going to have 25 on putting, but if there was ever a week to do it, it would be this one. Let's do five on strokes gained putting just in the last, you know, on all surfaces, all that fun stuff in the last uh, 36 rounds. Okay, so we, we've got a heavy dose of putting right now. Now, I think we have to do a pretty heavy pro, uh, a pretty heavy stance on strokes gain approach. It is always a very valuable stat and it is very, very valuable here. So let's go strokes. Let's do a little bit of a mix. Let's put 30 on it. We'll do strokes gain approach last 24 for 15 and strokes gain approach for last 100 at 15. So a little bit of long-term, a little bit of short-term guys that have done both well are going to get a boost in both of those. So we only have 45 left. Let's go to easy golf courses. Uh, so let's put 10 on easy golf courses. Let's put 10 on strokes gained TPC Craig Ranch. This is basically the KH Lee stat. I know it's only two years. Um, and then now we've got 25 left. So what we should probably do is we could do, I mean, I think we've got to do like birdie or better. Birdies are better gained for 10. Our last 15 can go on a split of driving and chipping. Just It's only 15. We'll split it. We're not going to put a lot of weight on it. Let's put strokes gained off the tee, last 24 for 8. Strokes gained around the green, last 24 for 7. This is our model. The number one golfer in my model is, to no one's surprise, Scotty Scheffler. 
no one's surprised. It's actually a pretty small gap, though, between him and Jordan Spieth. Jordan Spieth rates out very well. Um, I know he's the second most expensive golfer, but that is... So, so Scotty Scheffler is an 85.8. Jordan Spieth is an 84.8. And then the next closest golfer, Hideki Matsuyama, is an 80. So that that is a, a almost identical score for Scotty and Jordan Spieth. And Spieth is $1,300 cheaper. So that is a very, very good rating for Jordan Spieth. Hideki, three. Jason Day, four. Terrell Hatton, five. Really no surprises yet until you get to this. Matt Kuchar, sixth. $9,000. Yeah, okay? Makes sense. Mark Hubbard, seventh. Infiltrating the top 10 at $7,300. Tom Kim, didn't even really talk about him. 96. Christian Bezadenhout, okay. 8,000. Brandon Wu is 10th. Eric Cole is 11th. K.H. Uh, Lee is 12th. Tom Kim, or excuse me, Tom Hoagie, 13. Adam Shank, Sibu Kim, 13, 14, 15. Where is, I'm just kind of scrolling through here and seeing who pops and who doesn't. Adam Scott dropping to 20th at $9,200 is, is kind of tough. Chesson Hadley is a very good approach and putter, so him at 26th for $6,700 is notable. Aaron Wise rates out 31st. Just trying to see if there's anything super crazy here. Matt McNeely being 49th at 8,800 is not particularly great. Benny on same thing, $8,600. He's 60th. That's not great. Okay, well, there you go. I'm going to save this. So save this as 2023, whoa, 2023 Byron Nelson Monday. We can revisit this later in the week, but I don't, I don't mind this. This is pretty good. I probably would, I probably, what I will do on Wednesday or in the live chat is I will probably add more course correlation stuff. Um, just because two years at Craig Ranch is, you know, not great. So maybe I'll add a little bit more course correlation, stuff like that. Okay, cool. Sick. Well, we are rocking and rolling. Uh, the next time we have a DFS preview, so Monday will be for the PGA Championship, which is awesome, but there's plenty of content between now and then. Uh, otherwise, hit the subscribe button. Appreciate your support. Let's rock and roll. I'll do some fun stuff for the PGA Championship. It's going to be phenomenal. Best of luck. I'll talk to you guys soon.